All right, good evening, uh, Uplift Church, and those joining us for our Wednesday night Revelation Bible study here online. I hope you've had a, a great week and that uh, you are blessed. And we're just excited to be doing this Revelation study. Um, this has been a really good study. It's reaching a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot that I have been uh, asking questions about the end of time and Revelation. And so here we are at the beginning of Revelation uh, doing our study. And what we're doing through this is just kind of get a good idea about what Revelation is in the New Testament and kind of what the end of times look like. And we're kind of getting a foundation. Now, one of the things that we did in our first week is uh, we made a timeline. And over these first few weeks, uh, we're really not going to be referring to the timeline that much. And that's okay. Because what we really need with the timeline is to give us a good general overview of what the entire um, book of Revelation really means. And with that, we can really kind of give a better understanding and focus of really what that means for us. So with this, we're in the first part of Revelation in our timeline, and these are the letters to the churches. So we have the introduction of chapter one of who John is, and then in chapter two and three is we have these letters to these churches. And to kind of recap what last week was, uh, it was to the uh, church known as the loveless church, the loveless church. And in that, what they said was, or what the Lord said to the church of Ephesus was that, you, you know, you lost your first love, you need to return to that first love. And what he is really calling us to do is really have a vibrant relationship with him that we don't just fall into the habit or the routine of just going through the motions of being a Christian or going to church, but actually have an intimate relationship with him. And a lot of times, one of the things that falls behind on that that we discussed last week was that we just get so busy and that can really impact our schedule. And so we really need to be careful about what we allow into our time schedule because regardless of your income, or your family background, you only get 24 hours a day. And so what we have to do is be cautious about what we fill up our time with. And that's what he is talking about here, is that they had lost their first love and need to be a priority in their life and not just an afterthought. And so some of that, we come over to Revelation chapter 2. And so what we were doing from last week was discussing for this week, verses 8 through 17. And if you've read that already uh, of these two churches, uh, there's two of them here, uh, two different churches. And this first church that we're going to look at is the church of Smyrna. Now, this church had a lot of things going for it. For one, it was very wealthy. It was a very wealthy church. And a part of that was is that it was a center of emperor worship. But what happened through here is that there were really hostility uh, between these uh, Jews that were uh, still faithful to um, the emperor that they were there. And then they were also, uh, they were just very much challenged and they suffered persecution. It was inevitable. It was going to happen because of the groups that were there. They were going to face persecution. And what Jesus says here, and I, I really like this, in the very first verse, he says, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who is the first and last who died and came to life again. Now, what he's setting up here in his introduction to this is to really put a, an assurance to us on who he is. The first, the last, who died and came to life again. So if he's the first and last, he's the beginning and the end. If he died and rose again, he's overcame. So whenever we are persecuted, we need to understand that no matter what we may experience, Jesus is the first and the last. So our hope lies in him, maybe not necessarily in this life, but in all of eternity. We need to be thinking about that through Revelation, all of eternity. But then where it says that he died, and came to life again, well, he's already overcame. So that's why we, our hope is in Jesus. 
And so what he's calling out here to them is to really remember who Jesus was. And then he starts getting to the heart of what their issue is. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. See, this church here, what they're known for is the persecuted church. And what they were being persecuted for was their religious beliefs, their following in Christianity. And that necessarily wasn't too awful popular because here they struggled against these two hostile forces. Uh, one of these was these Jewish people that were just strongly against anything Christian, any form of it whatsoever. And then there also was the rest of the uh, people that were the non-Jewish population. And what they were doing is that they were just loyal to Rome. And so from all sides of the Jews that lived here at this time, they were under great persecution. And I know that we probably all have a different idea about what, what persecution is. But we need to understand that the persecuted church, what they were is that they faced hostile physical environments that have been just very, a lot of hostility towards them because of their religious beliefs. And what that did is that that created some great suffering. And so what Jesus calls out here and he says, I know your affliction and your suffering. And that carries on over to us today because he knows what you're experiencing. He knows what you're feeling. He knows all that's going on. He knows what's going around us in our country. He knows what's going on in the families, the turmoil in which we have. He knows your affliction. He knows your suffering. And now what they were doing, he said, but you are rich because they were really standing fast in this. And he said that they were really holding on. He says, I know your affliction, your poverty, yet you are rich, but you are rich. This is really good over what he's telling them that, what they're doing is that they're really trying to hold on and he's really encouraging them. He tells them in verse um, 10, he says, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. <laughs> now that almost sounds like a, a ridiculous statement. Uh, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. But what he goes on to tell them is, Hey, you're only going to suffer for 10 days. It's going to be short lived. But anytime somebody tells us that we're going to be suffering, we don't want to suffer. As soon as we, have pain or discomfort, we are we want out of it. The church, what he's trying to tell them is, is that your suffering you're about to endure, it's going to be intense. It's going to be very much intense, but short. That's the ten days. In ten days, and what he was looking at getting them to look at doing. If you look back at the verse, um, this is verse um, ten. He said, "Fear none of those things." which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and ye have tribulation ten days. But be faithful till death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, is that not good? I will give you that. I like what it says in the NIV. He says, be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the victor's crown. I love this. So what he says to this church He's really not saying anything really negative. He's actually encouraging them to hold on, to continue to do what they're doing. Don't give in to the persecution. Don't give in to what you're experiencing. Hold on. The suffering is going to be short-lived. It's going to last 10 days, and then after that, you're going to be able to really um, have a reward. And because of that, we need to understand that whenever we do this, whenever we face persecution, whenever we face suffering, that it's short-lived, there is an end in sight. Because where does Jesus point their attention to? Be faithful even to the point of death, and I'll give you life as your victor's crown. Life. So Jesus is trying to get them not to focus on their earthly suffering, but to focus on their eternal suffering home, their eternal reward. I will give you the victor's crown. Church, we need to remember this because I know that there's times in our life in which we experience pain, discomfort, suffering, and sometimes persecution. Hold on. Remember 
what's in the end. And he closes this to this first church. He said, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, but the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Now, what he's meaning there by the second death, this is at the end of judgment whenever what's going to happen is those who are not believers, those who are not Christians, at this great white throne judgment, they're going to be cast into their eternal punishment. And he says this is the second death. But for Christians, and I know that we're going to get later on into this in the Revelation when we start talking about different judgments, but we will not face that. And so he gives you a glimpse into that, that just hold on, just hold on, because here in the end, you're not going to have to face that. You're not going to have to face that. So that's what he's telling you. Now, if you look at the next church, the church at, um, I can never say this word, Pergamum, Pergamum, he says to the angel of the church at Pergamum. You may be thinking, why are we doing two churches tonight? Well, there's a reason. One was kind of being steadfast. They were not giving in. I know your affliction, your poverty, yet you are rich. But now in verse 12, he's writing to the angel of the church at Pergamum, right? And he starts out not saying, hey, I know um, I'm the first and the last. I know your afflictions. But look what he says. These are the words who him has the sharp double-edged sword. Now, stopping right there for a minute, as we talked about in the first week going through the this introduction, when Jesus introduced himself as this, it means judgment. Judgment. That he is the one, at his word, it judges. Sharp, double-edged sword. And then he says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Now, this is a very interesting. The church at Pergamum, or you can also see it as Pergamos. The actual name, Pergamum, this place where this church was at, not the church, but the city that the church was at, it was called the city where Satan's seat is. Now, how would you like to live in a city that that's what it's referred to as? Church, there was a lot of sin going on a lot of sin going on but what he said was he said i know where you live or satan has his throne yet you remain true to my name uh, it sounds like he's giving him a compliment and he keeps going you do not renounce your faith in me not even in the day of antipas my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where satan lives so it sounds like there's some encouragement here going on but in verse 14 he says something a little different. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Now, what happened here is, and I'm going to talk about some of these things in the in our in our guide. This is question number four. It says, What fault did Christ nevertheless find with the church at Pergamum? Well, what they did is that they allowed some of this false teaching coming in. There were actually uh, these separate cults four cults that lived there and they were practicing and teaching um, wicked practices food offered to idols sexual immorality and they was polluting all the people there and getting those to behave in this type of behavior but what the christians started doing here is that there was a part of a compromise and this is what's going to be hard about tonight's lesson it's because we always say that we want to be careful that we don't offend someone else. But we got to be cautious whenever we start going down that road because what can happen to us is that we could become desensitized to the significance of the sin or the situation around us. So we have to be very careful what we will permit or that we will allow to go on around us because not all behavior is godly. And not all behavior reflects God's love. It just doesn't. And sometimes whenever we call people out on their sin or their behavior, and we are looked at as being maybe uh, intolerant. But when it comes to the church, there has to be a line. There has to be a line. And my 
in my Bible that, that I use. Um, I just think this is this is really good. This is what it says in the footnotes of my Bible, and I want to share it with you. It says, there is room for differences of opinion among Christians in some areas, but there is no room for heresy or moral impurity. No room for it. Your town may not participate in idle feast, but it probably has pornography and sexual sin, cheating, gossiping, lying. Don't follow, I'm sorry, don't tolerate sin under the pressure of being open-minded. Now, does that not sound like some of the words that we need to hear today or that we even do hear about being open-minded? When we hear things about uh, sexual immorality or waiting until you're married, uh, almost anything in sexual in nature, well, you just need to be a little bit more open-minded. When it comes to same-sex marriages, you just need to be a little open-minded. These are different cultures. Well, these are some of the things that they were practicing here. And what Jesus calls them out on is exactly what needed to be done. And it still stands true to us today. He says in verse they were, this is verse 14. He said, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold on to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin. So, what do we say? That ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. They committed sec um, sexual immorality. But look at verse 15. Likewise, you... Also have those who hold to the, tick, the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And he tells them in verse 16, repent, stop this. And so what that happened was is that the church had become tolerant or open-minded to this other teaching. And now these sins are now, per, they were not being permitted in the church and as far as being accepted. Not promoted, but being accepted. And we need to be very careful about what we can tolerate and where there is a clear sin. Look at what it says. Repent therefore, this is verse 16, repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, this is talking about being at odds with Jesus. It's not that when we disagree with someone along these lines, it's not about us, we're representing Jesus and they are really at odds with Jesus. Whenever we speak truth and someone doesn't want to hear the truth, they're not at odds with you. That's why we need to hold steadfast to the faith. It's because they're not against you. They have a problem with Jesus. And that's what we need to be, that's really what we need to understand. Is that when someone has a problem with truth, it's not personal against you. Now, it may hurt you, they may say things against you, but it's not you that have the problem with, it's Jesus. So then why hold on? Verse 17, he says, Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious, I will give him some hidden manna. I will also give to that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to it, uh, to the one who receives it. Now, this is going to take a minute, but we're going to kind of wrap this up and really understand what that last verse really means because uh, there's a lot of questions revolving around it. So we're going to take a little bit of time to get there, but what I really want you to understand is something that Jesus leads up to with this. And in our book, it answers this under the reaction part of um, question number eight. It says, why is it often tempting for people to compromise their values in order to fit in? What does Jesus' message to believers in Pergamum say about this? In church, what he is trying to get them to do is to not give in to the peer, peer pressure of culture and sometimes when it feels like that you're standing you you have um, morals when you have a belief and you stand by it and what are some things that people say well you're old-fashioned are you still keeping the Bible that's 2,000 years old here's what we need to understand about that his word is forever alive and active. His word 
sharper than any two-edged double sword. It is active. It's judgment. And we need to make for sure that we are holding on to eternal life, that that's what we're looking towards. That's our reward, not what we see and face here. Remember to the church that he just got done writing to? He said, hold on. You, the persecution is going to be short-lived. And I know some things may not go your way, and I know that it may be hard, and maybe people want to give you under peer pressure, but hold fast to your values. Hold fast to your morality. So why is it often tempting? I think the biggest thing is, is peer pressure, and that's what I put on my answer there. Why is it often tempting for, crowd, for crowds to... Let me start over. Why is it often tempting for people to compromise their values in order to fit in with the crowd? I think it's peer pressure. We don't want people to be at odds with us. You can have the best day ever and people will compliment you. They'll compliment your car, your work ethic, your behavior, your clothes, even your hair. And one person can make a small remark and that's what we dwell on. Forget the hundred people that were complimenting us and that we're all good with. That one person, it'll eat at us and they'll dwell at us. And it's because... We don't like that type of feelings. We want everyone to get along, particularly with us. We want people to kind of go along with us, and we want to make sure that we're along with the crowd. And so when we do something that goes against that grain, and it hurts. Those comments, they they hurt. So Jesus is trying to get you to understand. Don't give in. Don't compromise. Be steadfast in your faith. You have those values you know what the Bible says. Now hang on. Hang on to those, excuse me, hang on to those things. And there's times that maybe you have allowed your values to be compromised. The thing about it is, question number 10 brings this out. And you don't always have to be told, do you? When you've done something wrong, when you slipped up, you don't necessarily need someone there to say, hey, you messed up. You know when you did. Question number 10 says, how do you know when you've done something that has crossed the lines in terms of compromising your standards? And what do you do to remedy those situations? Well, what I put on there is usually the Holy Spirit immediately lets me know when I have messed up. Doesn't it you? It doesn't take long to know that, um, okay, I, I felt like I shouldn't have done that. I reacted in a way I shouldn't have gave in. So the Holy Spirit is there with us and it allows us. Now sometimes we have the Holy Spirit, but sometimes the Holy Spirit may be speaking through someone else, maybe someone holding you accountable. And we need accountability in our lives. Someone holding you to a high standard. They're living by the same standard, but they're holding you as a, hey, you know, I think that you kind of were out of line here. I'm not so sure that that was, exact, that was exactly right. So what do we do when we realize that we've messed up or maybe somebody has pointed out? Don't get angry. Don't walk away from the church. Don't walk away from God. Apologize immediately. What did he tell them to do here in this church? He said, repent. And I think this is where the church struggles is that so many times, instead of repenting and going back to the church, we feel guilty and so we'll just wallow in it and stay home. That's not what he's calling them to do. And so then what we come to is that people say, well, I can't live it, so why bother? I'm glad you asked, because we can't. This is why we are under the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus. Because he died on the cross to overcome death and sin. He beat it whenever he rose from the dead. And now he's victorious, sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's victorious. And because he is victorious and we believe and accept him as our savior for our sins, he has forgiven us of every sin that we have committed and will commit. That is the grace of our Lord Jesus. So yes, you can't live it. And it's not an excuse for you to go and do whatever you want to, but it is a reason to continue to repent. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I messed up here. And sometimes you may have to apologize and ask for forgiveness from someone that you were at odds with or maybe sinned against. Church, saying those words, I'm sorry, is some of the greatest words that you'll ever say. I'm sorry. 
So now we come to the close that something that I want you to spend some time on. It says that in verse, or I'm sorry, question 12, it says, what are some strategies you have seen the enemy use to convince believers to compromise on their standards? And why do you think these are so effective? I encourage you to take some time really on that because I think Satan is very cunning in the way that he deceives people in this manner. Oh, it's okay. Don't be old-fashioned. Oh, that was such a long time ago. Let's get with the new age. Let's get with the new times. Not that I want you to discuss this uh, openly with a bunch of other people, but maybe this is something more for you properly. If, is there something that you've allowed, maybe it's currently, to compromise in any way your morals or your standards that allowed you to compromise? And I know sometimes that's kind of hard to think of. Maybe something you've allowed to go on in your home. Maybe something that you've allowed for your eyes to continue to see. Now, what our author brings out in here is maybe something that maybe you've given into. And I just read you a part of a Bible study and what it, or my study Bible, and what it brought out because we are surrounded by sexual immorality. It's all over television and movies, particularly the internet, and now we have it in the, or, you know, the palm of our hands of the cell phone. So is there something that you allowed to come into your life that ought not be there? It's okay. It's time to repent. See, Lord Jesus, I want this out of here. Let's get this thing out of here and let's focus on you. Because of what he says in verse 17. This is when I said that I would come back to. Okay, verse 17. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that again, okay? This is, this is verse 17. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give him some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Now, real quickly, there's two things here that he says to hang on, and I'm going to give you. The first thing that he does right here is when he's talking about, I will give some of what? Hidden manna. Hidden manna. Now, no one is 100% for sure exactly what this hidden manna is. And also, this I'm going to give this white stone but i did do some research and i want to share something with you and i'm going to turn to john chapter 6 because i want to share this with you because jesus had to say something about manna so i'm going to flip over here to john chapter 6 and i want to read this for you okay so if you want to write this down that way you can read it later then that's fine it's john chapter 6 verse 32 through 35 listen to this about the manna john chapter 6 32 through 35. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. And this is talk about manna. Manna was a form of bread that Moses used. Verse 33. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then they say unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So what he's telling them to hold on to here in verse 17, he's telling them, I will give them this hidden man. It's Jesus. Listen, just hang on to you that overcomes this idea, this temptation of giving in to the world or giving in to culture. Hang on. Everlasting life, he's giving you himself. And then he says, and he's going to give you a stone. <laughs> he kind of elaborates on this just a little bit more. He says, I will give you, give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. <laughs> what in the world is this white stone with a name on it? Well, again, done some research on here and I found out that in this region of Asia Minor, they had a kind of a strange practice, but here's, Here's what they did. It was a custom that what they would do during this time is that if they would give like real intimate friends, really close friends, they would give them a cube or a rectangular block of stone or ivory, the white, and it would have words or symbols 
engraved on it. And it was a secret and private possession. So one that only you and that intimate person shared. And when I say intimate, I'm not talking about in a sexual way. I'm talking about just someone that you're really close with. You have a really good friendship with. Well, they would do this as a sign of intimacy, the sign that they were, in other words, best of friends. Back in the day, people would say blood brothers. And we're not going to get into all that, but that's what they would do. And what Christ said that he would do is that he's going to give each of his own a stone with a new name engraved upon it. A new name, a new life. Isn't that what we've been given? We're saved. We've been baptized. We've been born again. We have a new life with Jesus. The old has gone away. The new is here. You don't have to be that same person that you once were. You're a new creature. The old is gone. The new is here. Praise God. You're not where you once were. You are still being transformed and being made new. I encourage you to take some time and meditate on that question. If there's anything in you, in your family, anything around you that maybe you've compromised your integrity on compromise and allow to come into your life that Jesus says, you know what? It's time to repent. Let's get that out of there. Let's clear the air and let's live for Jesus. This was the letters that Jesus wrote to the church at Smyrna and the church at Pergamos. And I hope that tonight has blessed you in some way. Please join us again next week as we're going to continue on in this letters to uh, the church. We're going to be covering one church Next week, again, is in Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29, and it's going to be a really good one as well. I'm very excited on it, the church at Thyatira. So I hope that tonight you've been blessed and that you maybe have a little bit better understanding about what maybe Jesus is calling you out to do. It's been a blessing. I'm excited. I hope you all are as well. Enjoy your study. Spend some time. We'll talk about these next one, this next church next week. Good night. God bless you all.